Hey everybody, it's good to be back with you. It's been a long time. Life gets busy uh, with COVID and everything going on, all the extra responsibilities I have. And then frankly, just the older I get as a professor, the more responsibilities out of the classroom I get. And um, that makes it difficult because one of the things I enjoy the most is teaching students. And so uh, it's good though, I set some time aside today to come in and to teach a little bit to you about stress strain and invariance. So we're going to get into some fundamental mechanics of geomaterials today. Uh, as always, whenever we talk about mechanics, we need to talk about the stress notation, uh, just so that we understand the rules that we're playing with. Now because um, this is a 600 level class, this is an advanced soil mechanics class, we're not going to be dealing in just two dimensions like we were in the past, we're going to be dealing with uh, the whole enchilada here and we're going to look at three dimensions and so things get really really complicated pretty fast. So um, let's understand a little bit. First uh, let's introduce our axis. We have our y axis going up, we have our x axis going horizontal, oh sorry, uh, my arm doesn't bend that way. There we go, uh, x-axis. And then the other horizontal axis is the z-axis. And you can think of that coming in and out of the screen. So with all of those, we have a cube here. It's aligned. We have normal stresses, which are denoted by sigmas. And the subscript denotes the axis that the vectors are acting upon. <coughs> And then we have also um, these shear stresses, which are denoted as taus. Now, uh, there's lots of them because they go in all these different orientations. And the way these work, is, uh, think of it like this. Um, so you see that they have um, two subscripts. So the first subscript denotes the plane in which uh, the, the shear stress is acting, and then the second denotes the direction that the shear stress is going. So I like to think of it this way. If we look at tau yx, the first, y, I like to think of it meaning it is crossing the y-axis. So think of it as a plane that intersects the y-axis. That's the first subscript. The second subscript, the x, means that it is going in the x direction, just like that axis over there. So the same is true of tau yz and, and so on and so forth. Now the dimensions of our cube uh, are defined as dz, dy, and dx, denoting that it can be any size of element that we're really interested in. Now these um, these sigma stresses, again, are going to be normal stresses. The taus are shear stresses. Uh, because we're dealing with geomaterials, compression is positive and tension is negative. That may be different than a lot of other materials or mechanics courses that, that you've taken where um, a material can can uh, be in tension just as much as or more than it could be in compression. But in geomaterials that's not true. It's almost always in compression. So because of that we make positive uh, compression. And then with the shear stresses we're going to say counterclockwise is positive. So what that means is if, if my eyeball, this is supposed to be my eyeball, those are supposed to be eyelashes. If my eyeball is staring at this plane right here, um, and I have, say, this shear stress, tau xy, that is making or trying to make the cube, and in other words, this plane, rotate counterclockwise relative to my eyes. And so anything that rotates the element counterclockwise relative to my eyeball is a positive shear stress. The other way I like to think about it is the right hand rule. So you can almost imagine um, if you rotate your hand, oh my word, don't hold that against me. <laughs> 
Okay, so if, if your hand goes in the direction of the, of the arrow there, so line your fingers up in the direction of the arrow. If your thumb sticks out, like towards you, that means it's positive, like you're giving yourself the thumbs up sign, so that means it's a positive stress. If you line your fingers up with the arrow going in a different direction, <clears throat> so like say that arrow went down this way, your fingers would follow that and your thumb would go into the board or or you might think of it as a as a down so it's like giving yourself the thumbs down and in that case then it would be a negative it would be a negative shear stress so just remember the right hand rule and you'll be fine okay i think we've got the notation down or at least we've got it down enough to move on Let's talk about our strain notation now. So that was our stress notation, now we're looking at strain. So we have the same axis of Y, X, and Z, and we have strains along those axes. So strain in the Y axis is Epsilon Y, strain in the X axis is Epsilon X, and Epsilon Z in the Z axis. <coughs> now, Anytime, if, if anytime I have like a cylinder or any type of material and I put a stress on the top of it, there's going to be some sort of deformation such that by the time, um, by the time I'm, I'm done loading whatever this material is, that, that change in length or the change in height, that that defines essentially what my strain is going to be. So the definition of strain is simply the change in length due to an applied stress divided by the initial length before the stress was applied. That's how we compute strain. And so because, by the way, um, these are both in units of length, the units cancel out, so strain is yet, oh goodness, let's go back strain is unitless. It's unitless. Okay, so um, in terms of displacement, we're going to use this notation right here, where instead of delta L, we're going to say uh, U is going to be the displacement in the x-axis, V is the displacement in the y-axis, and W is the displacement in the z-axis, such that, and, and if we go back to our original cube on the previous slide and take the original uh, dimensions of each side, we could say then that uh, my strain in the x-axis is equal to my change in u divided by dx, my initial uh, dimension in the x-direction. And, and y is dv divided by dy. And, and my strain in z, uh, the z direction is dw divided by dz. So you can see how that notation works. This is for normal strains. Now for shear strains, it gets just a little bit more complex. In shear strains, it's like we're, we're applying shear, and so that's going to distort the shape of our element. And it's going to open up these little angular distortions here that we're going to call gamma. Those angular distortions are shear strain. So <clears throat> what we want to do is uh, we want to be able to quantify that shear strain. So whether um, we apply a shear stress on a flat element like this and all of our strain gets um, conglomerated in one distortion right there, or whether we have um, counteracting distortions where we get distortion on the bottom and we get distortion on the side. Um, either way, we can work with it. The point is that uh, what we're going to do is we're going to define then the shear strain is just going to be the portion of the displacement in the x-axis um, relative to the change in the y dimension. And we have the, um, the change in the, along the y-axis and uh, relative to the original 
dimension uh, uh, of the x plane. And so we're going to take the inverse tangents of those. So uh, because then we can uh, quantify that the strain uh, uh, in the x plane in the y direction is equal to du divided by dy. Similarly, the strain in the y plane in the x direction is equal to dv divided by dx. Now, um, typically we say, let's see, I didn't mark the, the angle here, but this angle on the inside, we call this theta. So if I take the tangent of theta, uh, because this is small distortions, effectively the tangent of theta is approximately equal to theta. Therefore, we can say that the shear strain is approximately equal to our two um, strains, uh, our two normal strains, um, in the x and the y directions on the x and the y planes, respectively. And if we assume that those are equal, then we can just say they're two times that. Okay, so that's our strain notation. So let's move in now and, and do some simplifying assumptions here because we're dealing with now six axes along this cube and that's a lot of strains and stresses to keep track of. So there's a couple of things we can do. I mean the first thing, the first assumption is we can ignore that transverse direction. So um, in this instance we're only going to be looking at say like the Y and the X or the Z and the X uh, axes and, and we're going to ignore the other, um, hor the other axis. So in, in this instance um, we're only going to look at one dimensional loading. We're going to look at just the loading in the x-axis and we're going to assume that the stress in the y and the z-axis is equal to zero. So if I stress my cube along the x-axis and all the other stresses are equal to zero and I were to plot therefore the deformation, the strain in that cube versus the applied stress what I would see for any type of geomaterial is a behavior that looks like this. It will, it will load up initially linear and then it will start to go non-linear and even hyperbolic. So there is a linear portion <coughs> that corresponds to very small strains. And, and this is true behavior relative to any geomaterial, rock, soil, any, any of that there's always going to be an elastic or a linear portion. So this, the, the slope of that line is um, what we call the Young's modulus. Okay. So therefore, because it's just the slope of a line, if it's like y equals m times x, if I take that slope of the line and apply it to this situation, I could say sigma x simply equals the modulus in the x direction times the strain in the x direction. And that's exactly the governing relationship that we get as long as we're in the linear range. Okay, that, that equation doesn't work once we leave the linear range and we start getting into the yielding portion of the hyperbolic. In that instance, we have to start looking at what are called the tangent moduli, where we have equivalent modulus uh, depending on where we are along our hyperbolic curve. But right now, we're only looking at the linear portion. So the Young's modulus, it's, it's used to characterize stiffness in material. It's, it's a very common elastic property of material. We use it all over the place in material science. And, um, and it, it corresponds again to low strains of materials. Uh, so for elastic material, this, this value of the Young's modulus is constant. But for a yielding material, as you can see, if I, if I start yielding it, you start seeing how the slope of that tangent line, or not that tangent line, that, that um, that, that hyperbolic line there, we can see how the slope that goes out to it, the slope changes depending on where we are on the hyperbolic curve. And so because of that, 
uh, the stiffness changes. And, and generally the trend is the more we strain it, the less stiff, the lower the Young's modulus becomes. So that's, that's generally the, 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 the trend that we see. And this is what we call strain softening. But now let's look at a second assumption. In this instance, we're going to include what happens in the transverse direction when I apply some stress, sigma x, to one axis of my element. So when I apply, um, let's say that I initially have uh, an element that looks like this, and I stress it along the x-axis, what happens? That's right. It, it shrinks um, in this direction, but it gets longer in the other axes. And so that phenomenon is what we call the Poisson effect. So strain in the x and the y directions is governed by the Poisson's ratio of the soil. And we, we, the Poisson's ratio determines how much, if, if I squeeze something in one axis, how much it's going to bulge out in the other axis. That, that's what Poisson's ratio tells me. So it's simply the ratio of the strain in um, the axis of loading in the denominator uh, with the bulging strain in another axis in the numerator. So that ratio tells me the uh, Poisson, that's what I call the Poisson's ratio. Now, um, I neglected to cover generally a very simplifying assumption we can make with materials. It's a common assumption, is if we assume that the Young's modulus in, in all three axes is equal, then we call that material isotropic. And, and this is a simplifying assumption because instead of having three moduli, I just have one modulus now, and it's easier to keep track of. So we often assume that materials are isotropic. In reality, they're not, but close enough. So back to Poisson's ratio. Poisson's ratio has some um, various ranges. So, for instance, a Poisson's ratio of zero implies that if I strain something in the x direction, there's zero bulging or movement in the other axis. And and so if you go on YouTube right now, for instance, um, videos on like um, like slow motion camera. Um, hydraulic press with cork. If you were to go and search that, you'd find tons of videos online where people have taken cork, like from a wine bottle, and they crush it in a hydraulic press, and you watch it in slow motion, and, and you'll see that um, even though it's getting crushed in the vertical axis, there is no bulging at all in the horizontal axis. So something with a Poisson's ratio of zero is, is kind of freaky to watch when, when you see it get loaded. Um, that, that's something then that we would say um, is, is completely compressible to something that we would call non-compressible. So non-compressible has a Poisson ratio of 0 0.5. And all that really means is that if I bold something in the x-axis, um, and so I'm changing the original volume of my shape by x amount, it's going to maintain the same volume that it had before by bulging out in the other axis. So in other words, uh, a material that has a Poisson's ratio of 0 0.5 will maintain a constant volume no matter how much you compress it or stretch it. Yeah, we haven't even talked about stretching yet. Right now, we're only talking about compression because we're talking about geomaterials. Theoretically, if I were to change the direction of these arrows and put it into tension, we would see the inside of the box compressed that way. Okay, so what kinds of things do we call incompressible? Well, water and rubber. Now, rubber might surprise you. You might go, wait, rubber? I thought rubber was really compressible. Remember, what we mean by incompressible means that it maintains its volume 
perfectly. So rubber is a unique material in the sense that if I compress it in one axis, it bulges by the exact same amount in the other axis such that the volume of the original cube remains the same. Now soil, on the other hand, like sand and clay, uh, those values are neither 0 nor 0 0.5, but they're somewhere in between. So sand is around 0 0.2 to 0 0.45, clay is around 0 0.3 to 0 0.45. So um, what that means is if I compress sand or clay in one axis, it can experience volume change it will not completely bulge out in the other direction except if I get um, it's like fully saturated sand or fully saturated clay then it might. Now for most materials we are going to assume the Poisson's ratio and the horizontal axes are isotropic meaning they are the same value. That's a simplifying assumption that we make. Okay we've talked about shear stresses We've talked about normal stresses, we've talked about shear strains, and we've talked about normal strains. We're going to combine them now. And what we want to do is develop some governing relationships that will relate strains to stresses. So if I look here and have an element, for instance, where I have shear stresses that are inducing some type of shear strain, gamma xy, and I want to um, plot then that relationship. This is going to be very similar to what we saw with the normal stresses. Uh, same behavior, we have a linear component right there uh, that is where the soil or the rock behaves elastically. The slope of that line is uh, again what we, we call the shear modulus. We'll define that in just a minute. Typically though this only occurs for um, strain values that are very small. How small? Less than 10 to the negative fourth percent. Percent, that's right. So really small shear strains. Once we pass that we start getting into this hyperbolic region where we're damaging the soil material and it's no longer linear, it's hyperbolic. So if we're focusing on just the linear portion then the governing relationship is again using Hooke's law it is the uh, shear stress equals shear strain times the shear modulus where G is the shear modulus. Now we can relate the shear modulus to the Young's modulus um, using elastic theory uh, with this equation right here where we have um, again the Young's modulus there and we have uh, nu which is the Poisson's ratio. So theoretically if we know Poisson's ratio um, we can bounce back and forth between uh, the shear modulus and Young's modulus. We can also compute the shear modulus directly if we know the material's mass density and shear wave velocity. And this has become probably the most common and popular way that engineers and material scientists today actually measure the shear modulus of materials is they put a shear wave into a material and, and they measure its shear wave velocity. That's what this V sub S is. So this rho is the mass density of the material. So if we take the mass density and times it by the shear velocity squared, we come up with the shear modulus. <coughs> okay, now let's move to our volumetric or 3D stress strain notation. So just like we learned in one dimensional and two dimensional stress strain, uh, all of the symbols, all the signs, everything's the same, but now we can have loading that occurs on all three axes simultaneously, not just on one axis like we learned before. So let's introduce you to a couple new terms. So the first term we want to introduce you to is um, this sigma sub h. Um, very commonly we use the term p, uh, like from pq diagrams, that's uh, from the hydrostatic stress. So as by way of reminder, let's go back to the whiteboard here. Maybe you recall from Moore's circle, 
if I have sigma and I have tau and I, I'm going to do my best to draw a circle but it's probably not going to look very good that's not bad okay so um, I have this more circle here and you might recall when we learned about PQ diagrams that we said we can represent this this more circle with a single point meaning the very top of that more circle and so we called the coordinates of that point P and Q where P represented essentially the coordinates of the center of the circle and Q represented the radius of that circle. So um, we could completely just eliminate the circle and have a point which makes it a lot easier to follow and, and not only that as we watch that point move around as we load it or, or whatever direction it's going to go um, that represents the change in the Mohr circle due to the change in our loading. So we would call those stress paths. We'll talk more about stress paths later this semester. Anyway, I'm going to just go back to the single point. I digress. So with that single point there, that represents the entire Mohr circle. Now, um, that's just great, but remember, we're just looking at stuff in 2D right now. And with volumetric, we want to look at things in 3D, not 32, 3D. So P is, is supposed to essentially be equivalent to the center of the circle. Or I guess you might also call it also the average of the circle. And that therefore makes sense then that if we want, if we're dealing now with a sphere of loading, um, not a more circle, but like a more sphere, all we need to do is take the average of all of the normal stresses. And we're going to call that P. That's our hydrostatic stress, or very commonly called <coughs> the mean stress. So once we have P, or the mean stress, we can develop um, some interesting relationships. If I can compute the change of volume from all of my sigma x, sigma z, and sigma y values, all of those stresses are going to cause a volumetric strain, which is just a change in the volume of my cube divided by the initial volume of my cube. So that volumetric strain then is related to my mean stress or P using this relationship right here again it's just basic Hooke's law the only difference though you might notice is this B term and you're going what is B well B relates to Young's modulus B is what we call the bulk modulus and bulk modulus deals with volumes so whenever we're dealing with volumes, we want to be dealing with the bulk modulus, not the Young's modulus, not the shear modulus, but the bulk modulus. However, if I know the Young's modulus and I know the Poisson's ratio of my soil, I can derive the bulk modulus using elastic theory. Okay, and so the um, ultimately the bulk modulus is a quantification of the compressibility of the material. So, um, in other words, the, the um, lower the bulk modulus, the more compressible it is, the less stiff in terms of volumetric strain it is. The higher the bulk modulus, the more stiff it is and the more it resists volumetric strain. Okay, now let's shift gears and let's jump into um, looking at stress-strain relations in three dimensions. So we're going to make a very basic but important assumption, and that assumption is superposition, because again, we're dealing right now in just the small strain components of those stress-strain curves in the linear portions. 
So because we're assuming everything is linear and stress strain, we can apply superposition. So uh, superposition means that if there is a linear relationship <coughs> between the stress and the strain, then um, even if I have uh, stresses and strains going on in all these different axes, um, we can get the total stress and strain by just summing up the components from the various axes. So consider the following uh, soil element shown here. So um, if we just sum up the stresses and the strains in the y-axis, the stresses and the strains in the x-axis, and the stresses and the strains in the z-axis, we can get straight to the 3D volumetric strains and stresses. Now, often a, a simplicity assumption that we make is that we're going to assume that isotropic conditions exist. So, in other words, all the uh, properties that, that are maybe on the, um, on the x-axis and on the z-axis, the, the strain, or I'm sorry, the, the moduli, we can treat them uh, as the same we, through the uh, assumption of isotropicity. By doing that, we simplify the number of calculations we need substantially. Now let's go through and let's derive some of these stress-strain relationships. So um, if we just focus on this component of the equation, you're going to see that that's just basic Hooke's Law. That's just looking at it one-dimensionally again. But, but we don't want to do that. We want to account for the other axes as well. So all we need to do is for each axis, we have to subtract the Poisson effect. So we multiply the strain in the y-axis and the strain in the z-axis by the corresponding Poisson's ratios. Now remember, there's only one Poisson ratio and there's only one elastic modulus. That basically means, again, this is what I was talking about. We only have two proportionality constants, Poisson's ratio and elastic modulus. If we didn't, we'd have to have one of those for every axis, z, x, y, um, and, and so things get really complicated, especially when we get into the, the strains. Okay. So similarly, uh, in terms of the um, normal stresses and strains, we have relationships for the y-axis and the z-axis. We also then can derive the relationships for the shear strains and stresses, and those are shown right here. Where recall that these come from, these are the shear moduli, um, written in terms of, of Young's modulus. So every one of these equations, one through six, is a statement of different form of Hooke's law, which is the very, very basic physics. Now we can do some math on those relationships, and if we don't want to write them in terms of strains, we can write them in terms of stresses, so uh, either normal stresses or shear stresses. They all use the same equations, it's just depending on what you want to solve for. So that's just an alternative if you desire. Now, with this, what we can do is we can um, break those equations down, those series of equations, into matrix form, where we can put all of our stresses into a vector, all of our strains into a vector, and then all of our proportionality constants into a matrix, and pull out the constants that are, are relevant to all of them. Notice how nice this is. Uh, because we assumed isotropicity, we have zeros all over the place. I mean, that's great fun. Um, it really simplifies what we're uh, able to do. But because otherwise, you know, this this is a six by six matrix, 36 proportionality constants. Oof, that's nasty. So um, note, by the way, um, we're using Young's modulus in our derivation. If we wanted to, we could write these proportionality um, terms in terms of shear modulus or bulk modulus instead. But uh, just for introduction, we're just using um, the Young's modulus. Okay, now a 6x6 six six matrix is just nasty no matter how you look at it. So 
what are some simplifications that we can do um, to maybe break that six by six matrix down to something more manageable and reasonable? Well, one simplification is what we call plane strain. And plane strain occurs when we um, are dealing with an element that is, is sitting beneath um, something that is loaded in infinitely in one axis. So imagine that right here you see a wall footing and we're, we're assuming that that wall footing goes infinitely in both directions along the z-axis. So let, let's just do some interesting thought processes right here now. Um, there's vertical stress beneath this footing, yeah? Yeah, of course there is. And so that means that it can strain um, in the y-axis. Yep, absolutely. And if it strains in the y-axis, um, there it can also strain outwards or bulge outwards in the x-axis. Okay? So yeah, it can bulge out and we can have strain in the x-axis. But now the question is, what about what about this z-axis? Does it bulge out in the z-axis? And the answer to that question is no, it doesn't. Because sitting right next to that element beneath this footing is another element of equal size. And sitting next to that one is another element of equal size and stresses. And it goes on and on just like the footing does. So even though all these elements can bulge in the y-axis and can bulge in the x-axis, if it tries to bulge out in the z-axis, there's elements right surrounding them that are bulging out at the exact same amount. Therefore, the strain in the z-axis cancels out and the strain is equal to zero. Now, the stress in the z-axis is not equal to zero. There, there is stress in the z-axis. Of course there is, but there's no strain. There's no strain. So because there's no strain in the z-axis, everything that is in the z-direction, all the strains go to zero. So that means that uh, my, my normal strain and all my shear strains go to zero. Also, um, because there's no strain in that axis and I need strain to develop shear stresses, uh, my shear stresses in the z direction also go to zero. So with all of those zeros now added in there, I can go back to my equations of, of uh, compatibility and a lot of stuff cancels out. So if I go in and I rederive these equations, my six by six matrix simplifies down to a three by three matrix when I have the plane strain condition. So remember, plane strain is going to be relative or, or useful whenever we have the case of infinitely long, wait, how do I spell that? Infinitely long, loading. That's when I can do plane strain. Okay, awesome. Now, simplification number two is when we have plane stress. So now in this instance, it, it's, it's a, a very different scenario. The, the best example I can think of is imagine if you have a cantilevered beam that's, that's sitting out there with some um, load right on the end of that cantilevered beam. Now, um, because each side of this th very thin beam is exposed to atmosphere in that z direction, because it's exposed to atmosphere, the stress in the z axis is equal to zero. And if the stress in the z-axis is equal to zero, that has a, a really funky chain effect on the shear stresses in a lot of different axes, okay?
So every, every, um, all the shear stresses that cross the Z plane uh, or cross the Z axis, they're equal to zero. And all the shear stresses in the Z direction are also equal to zero. So these three right here, A through C, these mean that all of the stresses in the Z, Z direction are equal to zero, okay? So anyway, um, this, is a, this is an assumption that's much more common in structural examples than there are in geotechnical examples. In fact, I, I can't think of a single geotechnical example where plane stress occurs. Plane strain, yes, all the time, but plane stress, no. Uh, but I can think of plenty of examples in structural engineering where the plane stress uh, case can occur. So uh, it's important also that I, I emphasize that even though there's no stress in the z-axis with the plane stress assumption, there can be strain in the z-axis. So in summary, in plane strain, there is no strain in the plane of infinite loading, but there is stress. Oppositely, in plane stress loading, there is no stress um, in that, that plane of, of um, non-infinite loading, and, and, but there is strain in that plane. And so uh, these are two examples. Now, if I uh, continue along with this plane stress example, um, if I take then those simplifying assumptions and throw them back into my um, six by six matrix, it simplifies down to this three by three matrix uh, for plane stress. Okay, um, I'm, I'm going to take a pause here for a minute and go back to the whiteboard. Now some of you may be going, why in the world is he showing us these equations? I do not understand at all. Well, maybe um, you'll appreciate why we want these equations if, for instance, say I'm going to load a footing onto the soil here, um, and I want to know how much my soil is going to deform due to the loading of this footing. Now I have empirical equations, I have even uh, equations based on elastic theory that I could try to go and directly compute this. But we live in the age of computation, folks, and so one thing that I could potentially do is develop a mesh in my soil. Now it's, it's a popular belief that uh, finite element analysis is owned by uh, the mechanical and the structural engineering communities. Now, they do some amazing stuff with finite element analysis. I am not ever going to uh, deny that. And, and in fact, I'll, I'll say that they're principally responsible for it. Um, but with that being said, the geotechnical and the geomechanical community use finite element methods and finite difference methods, frankly, um, all of the time. And uh, they're becoming more and more used as software becomes more and more uh, user friendly. So if we build a mesh of nodes here uh, beneath our, L, uh, our footing, Really, if you zoom in, you can just see that each one of these is, is effectively a little element, like what we've been talking about. See that? So we can solve for the stresses in each one of these elements. And based on those, we can also solve for the strains. And, and so we can, we can predict how much each one of these nodes and each one of these elements connected to the nodes deforms based on these loads. And so mathematically, we can solve for some very complex computational scenarios. This is a very simple computational scenario for a geotechnical finite model. Uh, they can do some pretty wild things.
with finite element analysis. And so these equations that we're learning, all of these matrices that relate proportionality constants and, and, and stress-strain relationships, and strain compatibility relationships, all, all of these equations that we're deriving, the, those are what are used in these finite element analyses. That's why we're learning this stuff. Now that leads us to a term that I'm going to introduce to you today called invariance. Invariants are a way to take something very complicated and, and boil it down to something very simple. So um, it's, it's convenient to express constitutive relationships. Constitutive relationship means the relationship between stress and strain. That's what a constitutive relationship means. It's convenient for us to express these constitutive relationships in terms of these simplified terms or these invariants. And invariants are nice because they don't depend on any axis. So I don't need x's and y's and z's and y x's and y z's and x y z's and a b c's. I don't need any of that. Um, they only are based on the principal stresses, which are the normal stresses acting on the face of my soil element. So um, we, I've already introduced you to one. Remember the mean stress or the hydrostatic stress? So that's the first one. That's an invariant. And it's very convenient because do you see how it's only based on the um, principal stresses, the normal stresses acting on our cube. And if you're comfortable, like, wait a minute, I thought you said we're getting rid of X, Y, and Z, Dr. Frankie. What's wrong with you? Here they are again. Okay, you got me. Let's just change them then to principal planes. Plane one, plane two, plane three. That way the cube can be any orientation and it doesn't matter just as long as we identify the principal planes. These are the orientations of the cube where there are no shear stresses. Just normal stresses. Okay, so that's the first one. The second one is Q. We call this the deviatoric stress. And um, given our principal stresses, we can compute it using this equation right here. Okay? It, um, it kind of looks like Pythagorean's theorem, doesn't it? Yeah, kind of based on the same principles. Okay, so P and Q. Yeah, like our stress paths. Like, yeah, exactly. P and Q, same stuff. What about strains? Well, we introduced you to one already. Do you remember the volumetric strain? Sometimes um, epsilon sub p for like p from our pq diagrams. So the first is volumetric strain. And all it is using superposition is the summation of the strains in all the principal axes. And it's equivalent to the change uh, in volume divided by the initial volume of our cube. That's the volumetric strain. The next invariant is this epsilon q. And it represents the deviatoric or the distortional strain. So it's how much our, our element is getting squished and deformed and, and, and um, distorted. So these terms, P and Q, and Epsilon P and Epsilon Q, are our invariants. Why are invariants nice? Look how simple these equations are. Again, based on Hooke's Law, with invariants we can predict, for instance, the volumetric strain is simply the mean stress divided by the bulk modulus. Sometimes in certain countries, by the way, bulk modulus is, is um, represented as a K, and, and that's fine. It, it means the same thing. It just depends on which notation you're using. Um, 
So notice how similar this is to Hooke's law using one-dimensional stress-strain theory. Looks very similar, doesn't it? Similarly, for our distortional strain, um, all we have to do is relate the, uh, the distortional stress, Q, to our shear modulus. And because we have three axes, we're going to have the one-third there. And notice again the similarities between the distortional strain and just the regular one-dimensional shear strain. Again, it's all based on Hooke's law. If we want to put this in matrix format, it's just a very simple two-by-two two matrix that looks like this. Folks, this is why invariants are very powerful and they're very easy. You can, you can calculate them by hand and they can be very useful to you. What do we learn from invariance? Well, we learn a few things. The, the first, we learned that um, the mean stress is P. Mean stresses cause volume change. They cause um, changes in P, cause strains in P. And that's, that's volumetric strain. So if I change the normal stresses acting on my element, it induces volume change, not shear deformation. Um, conversely, deviatoric stresses cause shear deformations, but interestingly, they do not cause volume change. And the occurrence of shear stresses is only due to an imbalance in normal stresses. So if my normal stresses can't balance out, then Mother Nature puts in shear stresses to balance everything out. So this is what I learned from invariance. Okay, so the final part of this lesson is talking about different ways that we obtain our proportionality constants. In other words, our moduli and our Poisson's ratio. Now, before I move forward, I have to um, give a shout out to my good buddy and friend, Dr. Brady Cox, uh, formerly of the University of Texas, now at Utah State University. Um, Brady is going to kill me if I don't acknowledge that the most reliable and common methods used for obtaining our proportionality constants come from performing um, dynamic testing on materials. Geophysical testing, if you will, if, if you're out in the field. Dynamic testing is a way where we, we introduce waves into material, we measure wave velocities, and then we use elastic theory with those wave velocities, those wave propagation velocities, to back calculate what our various moduli are. So um, I sheepishly admit that I did not mention anything about dynamic methods in this presentation. Uh, however, uh, I am going to upload a copy <clears throat> of another lecture I do in my 545 geotechnical earthquake engineering class that talks about dynamic methods in the field, geophysical methods. And uh, it talks about how we can obtain uh, various elastic moduli values and shear moduli values from those types of testing. And I'll add that as a bonus lecture to uh, this series of lectures here. That way it'll keep Brady off of my back and keep him smiling and happy. I, I hope you're happy, Brady. I threw you a bone right there. Okay, back to what I prepared. Um, one of the old school ways that, that engineers would obtain these values is they would get samples from the field, they'd bring them into the lab, and they'd perform shear testing. Uh, so they would measure the stress and measure the induced strain, and they would go to these uh, experimental stress strain curves and they would focus on just the, the very first portion of that curve whatever that is um, I guess that's this portion right here and they would say okay that is my um, elastic modulus that's my Young's modulus right there and everything else is not my Young's modulus because it's, it's softening, so it's tangent modulus. Great, that sounds nice and wonderful, but we have some problems with this method. Um, namely, how are we going to get a good sample 
and get it into the lab. I mean, place yourself, you know, in, in the shoes of, of the soil that's being sampled. You, you've lived for thousands, millions of years in the ground, confined, and you've been happy. And all of a sudden, this, this noisy machine comes down and grabs you and pulls you out of the ground and exposes you to atmosphere where all of a sudden the stresses are completely different. Um, you're telling me that you're not going to be affected by that? I mean, let's reverse it. What if uh, I, you, you are a creature who lives in the atmosphere. What if I plunged you down to like 10,000 or 1,000 feet below uh, the water and said, hey, do you feel the same? Of course you don't. You're going to feel crushed under the weight of all that water pressure. And so you know, we expect the same thing from our soil samples. We, when we change the confining stress, we change the soil matrix, period. And so in doing that, when whatever we test in the lab is going to be different than what's in the ground. And the sooner you realize and accept that, the better off you are. The other problem is um, with this type of, of approach is that um, triaxial testing is based on large strains. And remember, modulus and Poisson's ratio, those are based on small strains. So again, this is where dynamic testing, like the one Dr. Cox does, um, really have uh, a leg up on, on all this laboratory testing stuff. Okay, now another one that a lot of engineers aren't aware of, but I think is really cool. Uh, engineers perform one-dimensional consolidation tests, or odometer tests as they're commonly called in some places, uh, to, to measure the consolidation properties of the soil to predict consolidation behavior. But we can also use these tests to obtain elastic properties of the soil. Yes, we can. And here's why. Because it's one-dimensional. It's one-dimensional, meaning if I have this steel ring that is very, very stiff and hard, and I come in and I fill it with soil, and I apply a vertical stress to that soil, now that soil is going to want to bulge out in all directions, yeah? Yeah, of course it is. But it can't because that ring confines it. That steel ring confines it. Therefore, all of the strain that happens in the soil is in the z-axis. But similarly, so is the volume change. So in other words, the, the strain in the z-axis, the, the amount that the soil settles, is linearly, directly proportional to the volume change in that soil. Therefore, this vertical strain is proportional to the volumetric strain of the soil. Therefore, if I take the change in my volumetric strain versus the change in my applied uh, effective stress and my consolidation test. Uh, folks, all that is is the derivative at any one of these uh, points on my curve. If I just take the derivative of this strain versus stress curve, it's what we call M sub V, or the modulus of compressibility. This is a term that um, we don't use as often as we should. If I take the inverse of that modulus of compressibility, I get what's called M, or the constrained modulus. And the constrained modulus is directly related to the Young's modulus using this relationship right here. So as long as I have a, a reasonable estimate or I measure the Poisson's ratio of the soil, I can get Young's modulus from a consolidation test. Okay, other things we could do. Um, we can go to the literature or to uh, popular textbooks like Bowles or Bardet 
and we can get published ranges of these various proportionality constants. So here are some published ratios of, or published values of Poisson's ratio for a variety of soil types and uh, along with the corresponding um, references uh, for those. And these are just taken out of tables in these various books. Now this is great. This is easy. I just have to look it up. The problem is, I mean, some of these have some pretty large ranges, right? Like 0.1 to 0.3, that, that's a reasonably sized range. So I have to be aware of the scatter and the potential for these published ranges to be wrong for my particular soil. Here's values for Young's modulus. Um, that comes out of the, the famous Bowles Geotechnical Engineering uh, textbook from 96. Here's some uh, other Young's modulus values that, uh, here's this table, comes from Bardet from 1997. You can always pause your screen and grab some values from there if you're interested. Um, Duncan and, and Bukignani in the 1970s provided a relationship between uh, Young's modulus and undrained shear strength and the overconsolidation ratio. So, so these are going to be for clays. So that's a graphical uh, approximate relationship. Okay, and then worst case scenario, you can rely on correlations with other in-situ tests like the standard penetration test or the cone penetration test to get your elastic values. Now again, um, you have to be careful here, okay? Because remember, these, these proportionality constants, these are elastic properties of the soil. They correspond to small strains. The SPT test, you're pounding a freaking pipe into the ground. There's nothing small strain about that. It's huge strain and you're, you're um, severely disrupting the soil. And the CPT, it's not much better. You're forcing and pushing a probe down through the soil. There's nothing small strain about it. So you have to be careful using correlations and understand that with each of these equations shown here, there's a lot of scatter. I mean, so much scatter. If you look at the actual data, it looks like grandma went and got the shotgun again. And so th there's a huge spread of data. Here's some more. These are correlations with undrained shear strength, S sub U. Again, tons of scatter, but it's, it's better than just guessing sometimes. I know some people who would say, no, guessing's better. <laughs> Okay, here's some notes that correspond to the tables I just presented to you. And you have to pay very close attention to these notes to make sure you do not abuse or misuse those tables or equations. Um, here's another correlation from uh, Don Caduto, uh, a, a colleague and a friend of mine who uh, has a great geotechnical textbook for foundation engineering. Um, I, this is a relationship I used a lot in, in my um, graduate work. Again, for the SPT resistance, and here it is again for the CPT. It's just a, a simple ratio. But again, tons of scatter, folks. I, I wouldn't rely on these too much. All right, that brings us to the end of our lesson today. I hope you learned a lot uh, and, and learned a little bit to appreciate what goes on under the hood on geotechnical finite uh, element calculations with the meshing and the, the elements in the nodes. Um, I'll upload a, a copy of the um, lecture on geophysics and soil dynamics um, <laughs> to keep Dr. Cox happy. And, and just remember again that those methods are probably the preferred way
for you to obtain proportionality constants for soils in the field. With that being said, thank you for your attention, and I will see you again soon.